A man with white hair walks out of the gates of Qingpu Prison in the western suburbs of Shanghai, China, on July 4, 2018, Hu Shitai, who was the chief representative of global mining giant Rio Tinto in Shanghai. Rewind to that early morning eight years ago when Hu Shitai was arrested in his own villa, followed by a search of his office in Xintiandi, Shanghai, where case officers found top-secret documents such as procurement plans, inventory cycles, production schedules of dozens of Chinese steel companies, and even internal minutes of the Chinese negotiating team. In his computer, confidential information was channeled to Rio Tinto's iron ore negotiating team, which in turn turned into an advantage at the negotiating table. In the era of soaring resource prices, this advantage made China a fish on the table in the iron ore negotiations, bearing an additional loss of almost 700 billion renminbi and allowing Rio Tinto, which saw through the cards, to make a fortune. At that time, many people compared the dependence of Chinese steel mills on imported iron ore to an addiction to drugs. The passive situation of iron ore negotiations made many steel mills realize that ore is the way to go, and after 2009, China's small and large steel mills started to collectively go abroad to buy ore, but it was too late. Hu Shitai was released from prison after serving an eight-year sentence and disappeared from public view. But during those eight years, China's demand for resource goods continued to soar. By today, China imports $250 billion of oil, $180 billion of iron ore, $60 billion of copper, $50 billion of natural gas, and countless other resources each year. Now it is finally the turn of lithium. As we all know, China as a major consumer electronics and automotive manufacturing country, the annual need to import sky-high amounts of lithium ore. Global lithium resources are mainly distributed in South America, Australia, and other places. China wants lithium, you have to import. China has missed several opportunities in the iron ore era. One industry insider recalls that China had the opportunity to take a stake in BHP, the predecessor of BHP Billiton, in 1992. In 2005, they had the opportunity to hold FMG, now the third largest iron ore producer in Australia. And in 2009, Chalco had the opportunity to take a stake in Rio Tinto, but they all ended in failure. Last year, the net profit of all listed steel companies in China combined was almost 120 billion yuan a record increase of nearly 80% year-on-year, and such an unbelievable performance was not even close to the net profit of one company, Vail, $22.4 billion, for the same period, whether it is the government or the private sector, China never wants the electric vehicle industry to repeat the mistakes of the steel industry. One of the purposes of developing new energy vehicles is to change the situation that China relies on 70% of oil imports, and if China has no say in lithium resources, then overtaking will become a slogan with limited meaning. In the first half of this year, China's new energy vehicle production exceeded 2.6 million units, accounting for 60% of the world, but in addition to BYD, no domestic electric vehicle companies can make a profit, OEMs were pressured by battery price increases, Guangzhou Automobile Group Chairman Zheng Qinghong said at the industry summit that he was working for Ningda Times. But who is Ningda Times working for? Traced back to the source, the car company's complaints are due to the battery factory on the upstream lithium carbonate price increases caused by the hands of the past year. The Australian company Pilbara auctioned eight lithium concentrates, the price soared from $1,250 per tonne to $6,350, a full 500% increase. But even so, lithium carbonate spot is still a hard to find goods. As the lightest metal on earth, lithium has never been as important as it is now. In this historical drama of lithium search, the Chinese were not absent, and even once rushed to the forefront, but like Columbus looking for the new world, the process was full of thrilling waves and twists and turns, some shed tears, some left regrets. Today we are going to tell this story about the lithium mine on the field, the ups and downs of the plot is really more exciting than the movie. Let's continue to watch together. Greenbushes is a small town in the southwest corner of Australia with a population of just 365 in 2021. It is a half-hour drive north of Perth, which is known as the loneliest city in the world. Although it has a beautiful coastline and sandy beaches, as well as a warm winter and dry summer Mediterranean climate, 
it is surrounded by the sea to the west and the desert to the east. Quiet, undisturbed corner of the earth. But beneath the town of Greenbushes lies a giant pegmatite deposit formed 2.5 billion years ago and 3 kilometers long, rich in lithium, cesium and tantalum resources, creating the world's largest and highest quality lithium pyroxene mine, whose lithium pyroxene production once accounted for 60% of the world. The high-grade lithium pyroxene needs to be crushed, separated, concentrated, deagglomerated, flotation thickened and filtered to yield a chemical-grade lithium concentrate. At the Greenbushes mine, two processing plants and tailings reprocessing facilities, built in 1985 and 2017, operate day and night to deliver high-quality lithium concentrates to the world. And a third, even larger processing plant, is in full swing, with its owner and largest customer, a Chinese company called Tianchi Lithium. Lithium concentrate from the Greenbushes mine is continuously delivered to this fully automated 7 asterisk 24 hour plant, where it is processed into lithium hydroxide for direct purchase by battery companies, with a capacity of 48,000 tons per year, at an estimated cost of is the lowest in the world. In the lithium field, Tianqi Lithium from Sichuan, China, and its head Jianguo Yiping are the veritable protagonists. Jianguo Yiping, a native of Suaning, Sichuan, China, entered Sichuan Agricultural Machinery College, now Shihua University, in 1977 and worked in state-owned machinery factories after graduation. In 1997, at the age of 43, Jianguo Yiping went into business and started a mineral import and export business, and his clients included a state-owned lithium processing plant in Shihong, Sichuan. Mr. Jian's business is essentially a resource hauling business, and the only source of hauling is the Australian company Tail Ison, which owns the Greenbush's lithium mine and will haunt him in the future. In 2004, Jian Weiping acquired the poorly run Shihong lithium processing plant and renamed it Tianqi Lithium. The factory was not in good condition at that time, but fortunately, as the penetration rate of 3C type lithium batteries increased, Tianqi Lithium quickly turned its losses into profits and landed on the Chinese capital market in 2010 becoming a member of the A-Share Small and Medium-Sized Board Listed Company, stock code, 002466. After listing, Tianqi Lithium was only a small company in the A-Share market, with annual revenue of 300 to 400 million yuan and profit of 40 million. This kind of day seemed to be quiet until early in the morning of August 23, 2012, Jianguo Yiping saw the news on the internet that Lockwood, the world's second largest lithium resources provider, was going to buy Tail Ison. Lockwood owned several lithium resources around the world, including the Atacama Salt Lake in Chile, which is the highest tasting and lowest cost salt lake in the world. If the acquisition is successful, Lockwood's power will suddenly increase, and it may even snowball the Greenbush's mine during the lithium industry downturn, shrinking supply to raise prices. For this acquisition, Lockwood is confident. On the one hand, the annual revenue of tens of billions of dollars is more than enough to eat tail ison. On the other hand, the offer price of 6 Canadian dollars and 50 cents per share is 53% higher than the previous trading day, which is attractive enough for tail ison shareholders who are eager to cash out. Jian Weiping has been dealing with tail ison for many years and knows each other very well. In February 2012, when tail ison was first rumored to be for sale, he originally planned to buy the shares in stages, hoping to gain control step by step in this steady way, but the American Blitz caught Jianguo Yiping by surprise. And Lockwood's most scrupulous is also Jianguo Yiping. At the time, Tianqi Lithium was Taylorson's largest customer, accounting for up to 40% of its total revenue. So before making an offer, Lockwood executives went around China and visited almost all the major lithium companies, except Tianqi Lithium. In a moment of life and death, Jianguo Yiping made up his mind quickly and assembled a team of advisors at the first opportunity. Tianqi Lithium hired Redbridge Grant Samuel, a local Australian investment bank, while Lockwood hired Lazard, a famous investment bank, and Macquarie Capital on Taylorson's side to serve it. The three parties are open to play each other, and the biggest problem in front of Jianguo Yiping is the lack of money. Want to defeat the strong rival Lockwood, acquisition success, Tianqi Lithium industry at least 5 billion cash, and this is equivalent to the year Tianqi Lithium industry in the city's GDP of one-tenth, and left him only three months, 
then Tianqi Lithium Industries' annual revenue of only 400 million, the entire group's total assets are only 3 billion, even if Jian Weiping all the money is not enough. The external environment is also not optimistic, the year China's new energy vehicle sales of only 12,000 units, the value of lithium is not fully appreciated, in the industry is very uncertain prospects, Jian Weiping where to find so much money. At first, Tianqi set its eyes on overseas, but due to the very harsh terms of the deal, it had no choice but to give up. At this time, a company called Leader Investment emerged. It was not well known, with a registered capital of only 100,000 renminbi, but its only shareholder was a big name, China Investment International Company. If you search for CIC International on the internet, you will find more than 3100% owned subsidiaries under it. The names of these subsidiaries are both Eastern and Western, and few people in China's domestic investment community have heard of them. They were actually all formed after CIC's 2011 reform, and each may have played a role in funding platforms for certain deals. And it was one of them that stepped in to help Jiang Weiping at the critical moment. In fact, CIC's overseas energy team has been concerned about global mineral resources for a long time, and has previously researched the Green Bush's lithium mine. However, due to its status, it is almost impossible for CIC to acquire Tail Ison alone, and it seems to be a better choice to let private companies sing the lead. So Tianqi Lithium, backed by top capital, began a step-by-step -step snake swallowing elephant operation. In order to avoid alerting the snake, Tianqi Group set up a seemingly unrelated subsidiary company Windfield Holding in Australia through its subsidiary, and then started to buy a small amount of tail ice and shares on the secondary market every day from October 2012 until it held 19.99%. On the other side, Tianqi Lithium actively communicated with all levels of authorities to obtain a series of clearance documents required for the cross-border merger. After reporting to the relevant authorities, Tianqi Lithium received approval from the Sichuan Provincial Development and Reform Commission in just over a week, followed by China's National Development and Reform Commission in November. Immediately after the board meeting, Tianqi Lithium rejected Lockwood's acquisition proposal with 19.99% of the shares, and then turned around and threw in a much higher price. At this point, the wealthy Lockwood was a bit gullible and insisted on its original offer. In the end, Tianqi Lithium's proposal was approved by Taylorson's board of directors and the merger was successful. After this battle, Tianqi has occupied a place on the global lithium resource map, and Mr. Jiang will not be troubled by the nightmare of necking anymore. The significance of this acquisition was far from being demonstrated back then. In 2013, China's new energy vehicle industry did not improve compared to the previous year, with only 17,000 units sold. Although Tianqi Lithium took over Tail Ison, the price of lithium did not rise, and although Jiang Weiping held the core assets, he was also burdened with heavy liabilities. Although it didn't take long for Lockwood to buy a portion of Taliesin's shares from Tianqi Lithium, but now looking back, Tianqi Lithium's deal is no less significant to China's auto industry than Gilis swallowing a Volvo, technology and branding can be precipitated through time but mineral contention is a 100% zero-sum game. In the current geopolitical environment, such world-class resource acquisitions are hardly likely to happen anymore. For more stories on the energy sector, stay tuned to our channel and we'll see you next time.